and that he's been, he's been working at his professional speaking skills for about 10 years and that he was not nervous in the least bit. And uh, I gave him a little coaching and told him, just settle down. You need to be a little more humble. So with that, I'd like to welcome Andrew Joseph. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, I have never claimed to be able to give a speech. I trap coyotes for a living, so this is, y'all gonna have to bear with me. Um, <clears throat> is that better? Okay. Uh, first off, this, I really don't have to get into what coyotes do. Coyotes and bobcats will wipe you out if you're not careful. Um, here's, here's a stat that I want y'all to think about. 45 days, $82,000. That's how long I've seen one coyote take to knock down $82,000 worth of animals is 45 days. If you're, if you're looking at this stuff as an investment, you have to be able to invest in a good wildlife man or a good predator control program or none of this is going to matter. Now, yes, there's some species that I don't get calls on. I don't get calls on sables. I don't get calls on Gimsbach. But there's a lot of these species I do get calls on. And hopefully today this will give you all a better understanding to maybe even – Deal with the problem yourself, or at the end of the day, you can give me a call, and I can go help y'all. Uh, clickers on the table, gotcha. All right, so what I'm going to talk about today is predators versus ranching. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I'm, my name is Andrew Joseph. Uh, I live in Lomita, Texas. I operate AJ Predator Control. Uh, graduated Texas Tech University. Nothing I learned in college applies to this. So my dad loves that. <laughs> Uh, I have 24 years experience in the exotic industry, and one of the things that allows me to do is I get to talk to y'all from not only a predator control standpoint, but I can also talk to y'all from a ranch manager standpoint. All right, so the four things I want to talk about today. So the thing about this that makes this hard is there's so much that goes into my world. There's so much info. There's so much stuff you have to remember. I'm going to try to break it down into four things that will help y'all on y'all's place when y'all leave here today. Coyote calendar and movement. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over what coyotes do throughout the course of a year. Until you understand what they do, you can't really stop them. The next thing I'll talk about is good ranch practices. There's a lot of things you can do on your ranches to improve your success and help with predators. I'll get into species awareness. I'll kind of go into what species do good around predators, what species you have to watch a lot more. And then finally, I'll go into a little bit of trapping methods and equipment. Uh, at the end of the day, unless y'all trap, y'all aren't going to understand if I get into what sets I use and equipment. I'll just show them to y'all so y'all know that, hey, your animals will be safe. So to start off with, I'm going to go over kind of like my overall goal of predator management. Number one is to protect, protect your animals means protecting your investments. These aren't $100 goats we're raising out here. You got to be able to protect like your your uh, dama gazelles, axis black bucks, stuff like that. Uh, second, we're going to provide good windows for birthing and maturity. That is the most important thing out of this. I'm never going to be able to get every coyote. Nobody can. No human can. But what I can do is I can get all the ones away from you. So maybe you have a couple month window in the summer to raise your fawns to some tor some type of maturity that gives them the best success to survive. Uh, be better than you were yesterday. Uh, that goes a lot into just paying attention to your ranch, paying attention into maintenance factors around there. Uh, learn how to adapt with predators. They are not dropping down to your level. You have to work to stay on theirs. That is so important. A lot of people underestimate coyotes, and they, they don't realize, like, you have to work to stay on their level. They're not going to wait for you. They're going to eat you out of house and home if you don't keep up with them. So first thing, I, like I said, what I want to do is I want to talk about the coyote, what I call the coyote calendar. This is going to give you an insight to what coyotes do during certain times of the month. So I'm going to start off with May 31st to the end of June. During this time, for the most of May and most of June, your males are the ones out hunting. The females are uh, into denning behavior really heavily. They either have babies on the ground or babies are hitting the ground any moment. So what this means for most branches, they don't take into account if that male is the one that's out hunting, you might not see him for a month. You might go out there on March or May 2nd and see a dead axis and go, okay, well, where did this guy come from? You call me, I go to address it. It might be a month before he comes back. 
he might have three or four females that he's checking on. Those females aren't going to hunt. They're not going to leave the pups, and they're not going to leave the den. It's all up to him during those two months. You have to be able to stop him. Uh, pups are starting to get on the ground the end of May, 1st of June. By the first, first week of June, most of your pups should be on the ground. They are not going to really do anything at this point in life. Uh, they're still a little too young, but what that does mean, and you see this below, the females and the pups don't leave the den. She's not leaving those pups. She can't. If they wander off, it's gonna be, that's going to be the end of them. She's going to watch those pups. Uh, May through June can be a real slow time because of this. If you've done everything you were supposed to do, so like for me, your typical trapping season is going to start in October. That's when I start catching coyotes and seal traps, and it goes to about the end of May. By the end of May, you should have everything that's close to you wiped out of there. When the, uh, when the females and the pups, when they start going out, that's when you start having problems in the summer. And that's where most of your problems will come from. All right, July 1st through September 30th. Uh, depending where you are in Texas, some places in Texas are a lot different. Uh, I've seen pups, or I've seen females that are pregnant in March. Then I'm, you get around Lano, Texas, maybe Kerrville. I was catching females that weren't pregnant in April. So, I mean, it kind of depends on where you are in Texas. So, take that into consideration. But starting July 1st, you're going to have some pup movement. You're going to have pups kind of venturing out probably 200 yards away from the den and moms stand by to uh, watch them. Um, let's see, July. August 1st is when you're going to start having pups move. I think. So August 1st, if those pups hit the ground at the end of May, by August 1st, mommy and daddy don't want the pups around. So what those pups have to do is they have to go out and find their own territory. That's not really a big problem. Pups really, they're trying to figure out, they know how to hunt, but they're trying to figure it out. That's a good time for you to get in there with snares and get the pups out early. Uh, pups starting to figure out their own territories, which like I said, is around the 1st of August. They they can go into a territory and think, okay, well, this is fine. And uh, all of a sudden, they have a male in there. When that male and those pups start interacting, and especially if they're not his pups, he might start killing stuff to establish dominance. So you got to be careful for that. Uh, God, y'all, this, this thing is going to be the end of me right here. <laughs> uh, June, July, and August, and I cannot stress this enough. And this is good because this is something that everybody in here can do on their own, and that is snares. There's nothing I can do as a trapper that's going to make traps work June, July, and August. It's a heat thing, it's a food source thing, and it's a travel thing. It's just not in my wheelhouse as a human to deal with coyotes in summer, but snares will. Snares are going to be your best friend. October 1st through December 31st. So this is when stuff starts picking up and getting busy. Uh, traps start going out. My trapping season starts, like I said, October 1st. Um, the way you got to look at it, if you, let's say you're going through the summer and you think, okay, I don't have a problem or I'm not seeing anything killed and you don't address it. Well, in actuality, you had a mom and her five pups around. Come October, or October 1st, that turns from one mama and five pups into six coyotes that are fully capable of killing. So that's something that October 1st, the re, let, me, let me back up. The reason why I like to start October 1st, when you have coyotes moving, if it's 90 degrees during the day and it's 80 degrees at night, coyotes aren't going to move in that. After 80 degrees, coyotes really falter. So October 1st, usually, this past year was a little different. Usually, you got a lot cooler nights, and you're going to start figuring out what you have moving around. Yes, sir. Yes, I actually will get to uh, that uh, later on in the presentation. To answer your question real quick, what I think you're asking is can you just do fence snares or you can do trail snares? Okay, I would stay away from trail snares at all costs. I understand the concept. I've done it. It works great in places like Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, where you're out there trapping 50, 60, 70,000 acres. For what y'all are doing, those trail snares in Texas, especially if y'all have brushy country, those trails might be the only way those animals have to navigate through that brush, and that means everything on y'all's place. I've seen it done. I do not recommend it. And to answer your question, I will have a number on here where I order my snares from. It's a guy that lives in Lampasas, Texas, and he makes phenomenal snares. 
Let me catch back up here. All right. Good news is, October 1st, like I said, traps go out. Nine times out of ten, if I'm catching coyotes in October, I promise you it's the pups first. They don't really know anything yet. I guess if you had an adult that taught them, like if you had an adult male that had been jacked with, and he taught them how to stay away from humans, you got a problem. But most of the time, pups are going to be the first thing you get rid of. You have to be really careful about how you deal with pups. If pups, for whatever dumb reason, are still with their mom, and mama sees one of those pups get whacked in front of her, it is a bad deal. Mama will backlash. She will retaliate, and she will go into what we call like revenge killing or stress killing, and it's a bad deal. Uh, so, go ahead. Sir? Oh, no. So, let's say you have snares on a fence, and it's the middle of July, okay? And you have five pups, and you got mama working that fence. I come in, and I set snares up, which would be my preferred way to go at them. If you get mama, or if mama and those other pups watch one of those pups get killed by that snare, what will happen is mama will teach every one of those pups to not go through a hole or check the hole before they go through. So, in other words, you'll have coyotes that will reach their paws in, look for that snare, and throw that snare off. Yeah, so long, st long story short, uh, two years ago I had a ranch. I started in June, which is not the best time to start, but I had to start in June, so I had to start with snares. I caught one of the pups on the fence the first night, and I could see by the game camera footage there was a uh, mama and five pups. So now I'm down to mama and four pups. It took a mile and a half down that fence and a month to get the whole group. Yeah, because they, they were never alone when they got caught. Yeah, so uh, two years ago, if you would have asked me, I would have said no. Everybody has game cameras. Everybody sees the lights. Everybody sees the infrared. Coyotes can see that. I would prefer you not to jack with them so I could go in there and catch them that, with them doing their same thing. What I have found is the higher up I got those cameras, the coyotes did not care and it upped my catching percentages dramatically because I could see exactly where I needed to be. The name of the game is I got to put the trap in front of him. I've got to be where he walks. And so game cameras not only helped with that, it also helped with locating a lot of animals for people, which was a great side effect of it. Uh, here's a good one. Starting, start establishing patterns and loops that they use all winter. This is a big deal. So in October, so let's say you, I'm standing right in the middle of your ranch. On a normal winter night, a coyote's range is going to be, I don't know, 14, 15 miles a night. So in most places, if I catch a coyote where I'm standing, it may not be a coyote that I caught on, that's living on that place. That, that dude could have come from seven miles away. But what they do is they do it consistently. The, each, each loop, so if they, if they have a center spot, each night's going to be a different loop in a different direction. They do that regularly, and they hit a loop. And it helps me pattern them. It helps me go, okay, this dude's in here killing if I can get set up and keep it going in between now and Thursday, I got a chance at them. Um, that really helps you also keep tabs with what's moving through your place and how many coyotes are moving through your place. Uh, end of November, first part of December, they start doing their mating habits. They start trying to pair up. Um, trapping will be kind of slow, but you will start dealing with pairs. So instead of mama and pups, now you got him and her going down the road. Now you're back to, if you get one, you better get the other. This is the time of year they start pairing up. December, I would say end of December is mating season. For about three weeks, it's going to be slow. Um, yeah. And here we go. January 1st through March 31st. Early January, ruts in full swing. I would say by the middle of January, they've already paired up. Uh, this is a good time for me to catch both. That usually happens this time of year. Like I said, it's a little slow. They might hunt together, and you might go, let's say you had a male and a female, and you knew you caught the female, you knew you had a male in there. It might, again, you might be three weeks before you see that male come back, because he might be doing that with two or three different females around. So it's not just one female, it's three or four he's got to hunt for and take care of. This all sounded really good in my head until I had to get up in front of people and talk. <laughs> Long story short, coyotes are bad. Um, April 1st through June 1st. 1st of April, female is out. 
trying to find a good place to den. Uh, a lot of people always ask me if they have a coyote den. One thing I will tell you, if you have like a 600 acre place, your house is in the middle of it, you and your family enjoy that place all the time, you're driving around it constantly, chances are the den's probably not on your place. Because all it takes is for mama to hear a car door, to hear people talk, and she's going to move everything and she's getting out of there to have those pups. So denning, actually finding coyotes, coyote dens probably never happens. Um, <clears throat> Around the 1st of May, the female strays, the, the female may stray far from the den, and the male is out doing the, she won't, or my bad, the female's not straying far from the den. By that time, she's found her territory, and uh, she is basically just kind of checking the area and making sure nothing's going to come get her pups. She's getting ready to have those pups. End of May is usually when pups start coming, but it's it's very climate and weather dependent. Like I said, this year was very off. It was insanely warm for a winter in Texas, but um, it did definitely affect animal predation. Coyote movement. So like I, and then this is kind of a general overview. September through October, most coyotes are caught close to pro, or are close co proximity coyotes. So in other words, from September through the end of October, if I catch coyotes on your place, chances are those were the ones living there. My goal usually is by November, I'm dealing with coyotes that don't live on your place. I'm dealing with everything around you. Uh, from November on, coyotes hunt loops, like I said, each night. They might come from as far as 12 miles, depending on the weather, 12 to 14. Uh, like I said, after 80 degrees, coyotes don't, they can't, they can't tolerate it. So like one of the ways I provide a birthing window is if I've, if I've caught every coyote that lives within eight miles of your place and everything's got to come from 10 miles, come summer when it's 80 degree nights, they're not going to be able to come the 10 miles to your place. So you might hear them around you, but you're never going to have any predation, which allows you your uh, maturity windows for your offspring. Uh, the ultimate goal is not to have any coyotes around by the time summer hits. That, I cannot stress that enough. People call me in January. Sometimes people call me in March. I understand why everybody's has things going on. If this is something you're thinking about doing, this work starts in October, and it goes through the end of May with trapping. By the time summer comes around, you should be keeping up snares, shouldn't be catching a lot. You might catch one or two a month. But long story short, you're trying to create that birthing window that your, your babies have no stress, uh, the parents have no stress, and they can just grow up naturally and not have to worry about predation the first couple months. Um, unfortunately, I can't catch every coyote. You know, coyotes started around Arizona, and today they go all the way to Central Park in New York. So basically, coyotes have taken everything mankind can throw at them, and they keep on going. So you're never going to get every coyote. But what you can do is you can get the killers, and you can get your problem dogs out of there. All right, good ranch practices. Now, this is something that kind of excites me, because a lot of people always ask me, what is stuff they can just do at the ranch naturally without having to pay somebody to do it to help them? And I've tried, to come, I've tried to write down a couple of things that I think would really help y'all. Number one, and I cannot stress this enough, keep up the fencing. Not only does this help you with predators, it helps you with animals and pigs. You never know when you're going to have a huge hole that pigs created, and then you can't, you can't find your axis, and you can't figure out where they went. All of a sudden, you're like, oh, well, I bet, I bet they went through the hole. Keep up with the fencing. When, you, when I go into a place, like I said, by the end of November, I've gotten everything that probably lives on that ranch. At that point, your fight should start and end on your perimeter fence. It should never make it past those snares. Yes, sir. When you say skirt it, what do you mean? Yeah, so what I would tell you first off, do what you have to in the moment. Okay, so if that means fill the hole in, fill the hole in. I will tell you this. At some point, you will have to square up with them. You'll have, you'll have to kill them at some point. Yeah, so what he'll do is you'll fill in that hole, and he'll go figure out a different place down the fence to do it. He. Yeah. 
So in my opinion, I'd rather put a snare. Um, I do know the predator wire, the, the, the layer of wire they lay on the ground, I know that helps. That will slow down a lot. Um, and I hate to say it this way, it's going to sound cliche, it won't stop the killers. Okay, I, I can show you two different types of coyotes. I can show you coyotes that I can walk up to, and they're going to lay down, and it's, it's pretty basic. And I can show you coyotes that you can walk up to, and you can look them in the eyes, and you're like, oh, that's a not messing around coyote. Those dudes are the ones that climb. Uh, the only thing about putting the skirting down that I've found that kind of isn't a good thing is if you get the smart ones, he's going in. Like, nothing's going to stop him. He, he knows that Axis, all he's got to do is run it until it lays down, then he can get it. It's an easy meal. He'll go, he'll go, he'll start climbing it. He'll climb about halfway up your fence and pop through a square. Yeah. And that, and that, you know, if you live in South Texas where you got sand, you may not have that problem right away because it's easy for them to go dig a hole 20 other places. But if I go out to Mountain Home and their, half their fence is built in rock and that one hole that he had was prime real estate, he's getting in somehow. He's going to figure it out. So definitely... I would say put panel up until you can figure out a, a permanent solution. And in my mind, that'd be te learning how to snare. Learn it, like me showing you how to snare would take five minutes. You putting up a snare would probably take two. Now you're talking about saving a $20,000 animal with four minutes of time and equipment. Yeah, I'm going to do about five, ten minutes for questions at the end. I will definitely dive back off into that one. Uh, here's a big one. Have a gut pit. I cannot stress this enough. Now, everybody here, most of y'all have ranches, and everybody here has hogs. I get it. You got to shoot pigs. Nobody wants to go shoot 15 pigs and haul it off to the gut pit. But if you got a trapper out there, that trapper does. Because what will happen is, let's say you shoot 20 pigs in a pasture, and I got to be in that pasture because you're losing Don McZell's hand over fist to a coyote, now you just created 15 different meals for that coyote to eat. So in other words, that just prolongs him being in there and me not being able to get It makes my job really hard. Definitely pick up dead pigs and definitely have a gut pit. We all have stuff that's going to die, disease, age, whatever. Don't leave it in the pasture. Definitely have a gut pit. And uh, we just talked about this. Use the game cameras. Uh, they... Yeah, use the game cameras to really keep tabs on coyotes around your place. So from my standpoint, if you, if you call me and say, Andrew, I need you to come down, I got coyotes. I'm on my way. I show up, and it's 2,000 acres. It doesn't matter how good of a trapper I am. I've still got to figure out what I call the natural flow of your place. Coyotes follow coyotes. All coyotes are going to use the same in and outs of your ranch. It's all, it's all learned behaviors. So until I learn that, those game cameras put me on target quick. And if we're talking about a killer, time is money. So definitely look into the game cameras. It, like I said, if nothing else, if you haven't found that kudu bull in five days, you'd be surprised how many times he might walk in front of that game camera and, and help you all with inventory. Uh, here's another one that I just ran into this summer. Stay on top of mowing in the summer. Now, I know everybody wants to keep tall grass because they think that it helps the babies hide. And in, the, and in your open pasture, you're right, it does. It really helps them. It gives them a place to hunker down. Where mowing helps me the most is if you mow the roads through your ranch, you give me a great place to go at a coyote anywhere on your place. The coyotes are just like people. If you have five-foot-high grass in your pasture, coyotes don't want to walk through that stuff and get hit in the face just like a person would. And they're going to use the roads because it's the easiest and the quickest. And chances are most of y'all's ro roads are the most efficient way around y'all's places for a reason. It just so happens the coyotes know that. They can cover the whole ranch. Definitely... Definitely mow roads where you can. It really makes my job a lot easier. Uh, oh, All right, we're going to get off into this one, so y'all going to have some patience. No poison meat. No hooks in meat. And I'm, I'm going to get into this. I get asked a lot of times by people, they say, hey, have you ever heard of anybody poisoning coyotes? Yes, I have. And that is the worst thing you can do. Now we're back to the mama and the pup scenario, okay? So let's say... You put poison in a, in a ball of meat, and you start throwing balls of meat down the road. Mama comes down the road with five pups and her. One of those pups eats that meat, dies right there. All those other pups saw it, and Mama saw it. So now what Mama's going to do is Mama is going to start killing every night because she's not going to trust anything laying on the ground. 
If she didn't kill it, she's not eating it. Last time that happened, she lost a pup. So definitely do not do the poison meat. The hooks in the meat, yeah, that's a thing. People try it. If y'all can show me a picture of that working, I'll tell people to do it. In other words, just don't ever, don't ever do either one of those. Let somebody come in and mess with these coyotes that knows how to do it. This is all about reaction. As ranchers, you're going to have interactions with coyotes. That's, nothing's going to stop that. How you react to that is going to either determine your success or your failure. They're going to learn either way. Either they're going to not be there tomorrow or they're going to be there tomorrow and they're going to be a day smarter on you. So definitely, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I'm fixing to get into that. Yeah, th that's a great tool. I know what I said about poisoning. It, when I explain the M44s, it's actually a lot different concept. <clears throat> the next thing I want to talk about, and this is going to help the ranch owners a lot, try, I know everybody's short-staffed. I know every, on a ranch, I've worked on a ranch, everybody has jobs they have to go do. Okay, if you've committed to a predator program, which you should, I mean, this is protecting your investment, Try to commit, try to be able to commit one employee to at least five hours a week towards this. And by that, I mean, whether it's me trapping, I show up, I get to go ask the same guy every week, like, hey, what have you seen? Where are you having problems? What's going on out there? That guy's out there all the time. Uh, inventory managers make the best person for this. I work with Wildlife Partners, inventory man manager Clay at Mountain Home. And the amount of communication me and that guy have it makes my job so much easier, and it makes his job easier. Um, try to commit one person to it. I know it's tough. Whether that person's running snares, checking conor bears, checking animals. If nothing, just get the guy to do a herd count. Because the day, if you count your short two bus box two times in a row, call me. Chances are something's happening. But definitely try to commit one person to at least five hours a week checking fence, checking animals, checking for scat and tracks in the road, just staying on top of it. All right, now we're going to talk about uh, species awareness. Let's be honest about buffalo and Audad. That $4,500 Audad ram can very much stop me from protecting your $25,000 Dama gazelle babies. And that is not a good thing. Audad, any of your sheep species, and then, and then I'm, not tell, I'm never going to tell somebody what to have. But I will tell you what makes my job a lot easier. The bison and the audad do not. If you look at buffalo and you look at what a buffalo eats uh, over the course of a year, you got to really love buffalo to have them around because that is a high-maintenance animal. you got to be like half Indian and really love buffalo. Because what buffalo do, and I trap on a ranch in Bend, Texas, two and a half hours north of here, the man had 80 buffalo on 1,400 acres. I took one coyote out of there in four months, and he was still getting it handed to him. Because what those buffalo do, those buffalo still have a predator response towards, you know, the smell of coyotes. I trap coyotes making spots smell like other coyotes. So when a buffalo comes down the road, smells that, his first reaction is going to be to stomp my set. So either he's going to stomp the set and ruin my trap, or he's going to set the trap off. Either way, that trap's not running, and it's not doing y'all any good. And, I mean, it's... It's something I see, and I, I see guys that are deep into exotics doing great, but then they have 20 Audad on 500 acres. Well, I really like Audad. My son's like honey Audad. Well, cool. Like I said, your $4,000 Audad just made it where I couldn't protect your very expensive Vinyala, Damas, stuff like that. Definitely be real with yourself about what you're all trying to do. The biggest mistake I see people make is they have the money to get into it, and they're, they're passionate about it, and they want to do it, and they start picking species off the board. And they don't ever take a time to take a step back, look at the ranch, look at where they are, and go, hey, what am I actually naturally set up for? Be okay with what you have. The buffalo, it's just, it's just never worth it. Know what, <laughs> go ahead. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> I could get into how many all that I, I have to deal with a year. They're probably not good for my business. But let's just say it's something about those two specific species and their predator response. Audad, it's, it's almost, the best way I can describe Audad, it's like they, they don't care. Like they, they, it's like they want to go to smell the same stuff a coyote does. And it's weird. And it's, it's frustrating because then I got to turn a 320-pound ram out of a trap. <laughs> don't ever be that guy. <laughs> I don't know. Listen, I had to shoot him. I don't know why. Uh, know what does 
know what does good in pens and what does good in the open pasture. Like I said, I don't get phone calls. Over, I swear, just take it away from me. I don't get phone calls over Sable. I don't get phone calls over Oryx. I don't get phone calls over Ginsbach, which is an Oryx. Uh, zebras, none of that stuff ever has predation. Those are some mamas that you would never want to mess with. Now, if you have hog deer or if you have fallow does that have been in a pen their whole life, don't kick him out into the pasture. That's just asking for it. There's a lot that puts a lot of that into the coyote's favor. Um, know the raising habits of your species, and this is a big one. Uh, one thing I always get asked is, if you call me, and if I'm trapping for you, and you call me, and you're two hours away, and you say, hey, I can't find my sable, baby, and it's my job to protect that, I'm getting in that truck right then and there, and I'm coming to you. But... On the flip side, when I say know the raising habits, know that if a sable mama has a baby, it might be a month and a half before you see it to begin with. It doesn't mean something ate it. Like, if you told me, hey, I think a coyote's got it, I'd probably be like, uh, probably not, but let's see if we can go find it. Uh, some animals that have great, like I said, great predator resistance, the roan, sable, kudu, any of your orcs, uh, blessed bog, okay, buffalo. I'd like to see that try to happen. Uh, no guys, zebra, addicts, those are all great parents. You know, uh, does anybody here raise goats? Or anybody ever been around goats? Okay. Boar goats are looking for a place to die. They don't care about living. Spanish goats are going to fight you till you, to they're dead. Think of it that way. You have good parents and you have bad parents. Not so good as far as predators, axis, fallow, and black buck, any of your sheep species, uh, impala offspring, dama offspring, and I'll get into why on those two. Uh, your whitetails, a good predator program will allow you to thrive with these. Uh, when it comes to axis, a lot of places don't like losing axis because that's the one animal they have that their friends and family can shoot. Coyotes, it takes one coyote male to kill an axis male, which is pretty impressive considering axes are designed to kill dogs, but they don't. Ax or coyotes, all they gotta do is they gotta stay about 50 yards behind an axis and wait for the axis to lay down because he's too hot and tired and then that's it. So it can be done. Axis and black buck are what I call first night animals. Uh, let's say I've trapped all the coyotes off your place by December. In February, a new coyote comes through that's never been on your place, doesn't know what animals you have, doesn't know how to get around it. They're probably going to get an axis or a black buck that first night because they're just that easy to get. But they, it is very doable to raise them. Like I said, if you're thinking about doing these, invest in a trapping program. Uh, if you look at Inyala, one Inyala female, one black wildebeest female, one Dama gazelle female, one blessed bok female, there's a bunch of species where one baby, if I save one baby, that more than covers the cost of what it, it takes me to do it for a year. So if you're looking at a herd of 20 Dama gazelles, yeah, invest. Because you're looking at a big paycheck if, if they all make it. Okay, this is not an easy picture to look at. Coyote on the left, that's what happens when Gimsbach find a coyote. They got zero tolerance for it. Coyote on the right, uh, he got pretty lucky. That's Gimsbach, or that's Sable, and he didn't make it five minutes. I got a phone call at 9 o'clock in the morning from a ranch owner saying, hey, you got one on top of the hill. I got there at 9.45, and he'd been dead for a while. So just to let you know, a lot of your exotics will not tolerate it. There's a lot of good ones to have. Oh, yeah. Not even joking around. Yeah, and you know what the, fun, you know what the great thing about the oryx species is? Those babies are lethal when they have eight inches of horns. Ask Tad and all those catch guys. You can go grab a full-grown Gimsbach cow, and she's got to really duck that head and and really swing that head the right way to get you with the tip of those horns. Babies that have eight-inch horns, yeah, they're good to go. They will demolish coyotes. All right, so just real quick, I'm going to get into trapping methods and some of the equipment that I use. Like I said, I'm not going to get in like, what sets I use and lures and smells, because unless y'all trap, it's just kind of a waste of y'all's time. But I do want to show y'all some of the equipment. So this is what the basic size trap that I use. This is a Bridger number two. It's got a little over five and a half inch jaw spread. Not the best coyote trap, but it's my favorite coyote trap because 90%, 98% of what y'all raise, that trap will go off and close underneath the hoof of the animal 
and never bother it. That's why I use those small traps. And plus, with those traps, it's kind of hard for me to explain, but long story short, I have an offset gap in those jaws. I have about an inch gap, or half an inch. Most of your hoof stock, those traps are designed to hold anything with knuckles. So nothing with knuckles is going to be able to pull out. If that closes on a hoof that's all flat, round surfaces, that trap pops right off. Unless you're an dad. Snares. Here you go. So snares are always going to be my favorite thing to use in the summer. That is going to be your first and best line of defense on your perimeter fencing. Like I said, if you've done everything you're supposed to do from October to the end of May, you will survive on snares and be just fine throughout the summer. It's easy to learn. It's very easy to set up. You can have no trapping experience, and after about 20 minutes of me showing you, you'd be dead. You'd be good to go with the snare. And it's easy, and you don't have to be an expert trapper to make it work. Good thing about snares, it also helps with your hog problems. Um, a lot of people don't ever take into account hogs. I've seen hogs kill babies. I've seen hogs do a lot of damage. The main thing I would say for me is hogs keep it where I can't do my job, and they're very good at messing me up. So if you ever have a chance to inadvertently control pigs, this is a good one. It's very affordable to, to snare. Uh, it's $26 per dozen before shipping. Like I said, I live in Lampasas, Texas, and there's a man there that makes the finest snares I've ever run, and he will ship them to you. His name is Roger Lawson. I put his name right there, and there's his phone number for anybody that wants to uh, give him a shout. M44s. This is something I'm actually very excited to talk to you all about. So everybody thinks these are the end-all, be-all of coyote and predator management, and that is not the case. Because like I talked about earlier, now you're getting back into the danger of educating if you don't run them right. The plus side to them is they allow me to be anywhere. I don't have to worry about what animals you have walking around in any given spot when I have M44s. They can't mess with them. That gun is very much designed to be a canine response. Canines are about the only thing that's going to actually have the response to grab a hold of the head, which is right here. This head right here screws on the end. This is all mechanical. This isn't an explosion. It's, it's kind of like a cap and bolt gun. Nothing's going to pull on the head but a K9. It's a K9 response. So that makes it safe to run around all your exotics. Now, the reason why I love these, they're very effective during the summer months, but you have to be in the place to use them. You have to be in that place where you have that one male running around, that one female that you still need to get. That's what those are for. I can kill coyotes with M44s. If you ask me to come to your place in October or November and all you want me to do is run guns, I will eventually create a problem that you do not want to see. And that is that one coyote that learned and now he's teaching everybody else. I caught a coyote, I, that coyote that I was telling you all about that did, the, uh, that did, did all that $82,000 worth of damage in 45 days. I caught him. Caught him in 45 days. And it took everything, I, that was the only thing I had going on. A year goes by, and all of a sudden I start seeing stuff killed the same way. I start seeing, I start seeing animals dead on the same pattern. I start seeing, mainly I start seeing animals tore up the exact same way. And I'm like, what is going on? This is getting kind of eerie. I end up catching two juveniles that I promise were taught by him how to do that. So very much everything you do has a reaction in the predator world. You can use those to really save you, or you can use those to really screw you up. Um... Downfall to those, you don't go home after cyanide. They don't make an uh, antidote anymore, and so i got to go out there and hope I went to church that weekend and nothing happens to me. Uh, like I said, it's not an end-all, be-all solution. So basically what I try to do is I try to develop four tools to go at coyotes. Trapping, M44, snaring, and calling. You very much need multi-tools to go at predators. One tool will end up working, you'll work yourself into a bind because they get smart to it. Man, I should have proofread this thing before I came. <laughs> I tried. Calling. It's a great tool to use certain times of the year. In my opinion, and now granted, this is a very touchy subject. Where I live in Texas, I would say I have the month of December and the month of May. Half of April, half of May. Those are going to be your two best months to call. Uh, results, 
Results may depend on where you live. The one thing that, and I hate, I'm not trying to offend anybody, every high school kid with a thermal has a call. Every coyote out there has heard a call. Good calls, bad calls, they've heard them all. If you do it, you have to commit to it. So, like, let's say you had an axis killed, and you walk out there at 11 o'clock in the morning, and there he is, you can tell it's a coyote. You decide you're going to go call him that night. The chances of you calling back in the one that killed that axis are very, very slim. It just doesn't work like that. Uh, it's good It's good to do is it an overall tool. Like I said, you'll get coyotes, and dead coyotes are good coyotes, but it may not be effective as you going in there and targeting that one that you need to get. Uh, calling is a good way to start early and deal with pups. I will say that. Pups, are, for the most part, are generally pretty dumb, and so they'll come into most of those calls still. So if you don't want to waste time uh, trapping pups, which I don't, sometimes if I, tra- if I catch nine pumps in a month, chances are I'm going to have to move the traps in the area because everything's already used to what's going on. Oh, wow. It took a lot. I went through this faster than I thought. So one thing, I'm going to try to summarize everything, then I'm going to try to open it up to questions because I think that's where we're going to do the best. Don't wait to call. Um, like I said, if you're going to call me, if, if, if the route that you choose to take is a professional trapper, there's me and I have two friends that I can call, depending on where you are in Texas, that will go and help you. But don't wait to do it. The faster we can get in there in those prime months, like October, November, the faster we can do a better job. Uh I will do snare instructions, ranch consults, and trapping for people. Uh, and y'all can get with me after this for that. I don't know why that slides on this one. If you have coyote questions or just want to know what I think about, you know, what animals work good for you on your ranch as far as predation and buying from wildlife partners, give me a call. I'm always available to talk. I will answer any questions. Uh, commit to a good man- predator management program. So let's, you'd be amazed at what just snaring will do. So most places I go to, you know, I, wildlife partners in Mountain Home, a lot of coyotes for them is five. Like if I caught five coyotes in Mountain Home, that'd be a lot. Now if I go to Lano, to one of my ranches in Lano, I catch five coyotes, I'm not going to have a job next year. It just depends on where you are and what your coyote densities actually look like. And like I said, commit one employee to the program. Inventory managers work out best. Clay. Uh, like I said, uh, I run AJ Predator Control. I'll do ranch consults, trapping services, trapping instructions. That's how you can get a hold of me. And I think I'm going to open it up for questions now. Does anybody have any questions? That's a good question. So Clay's question was, what is the first thing you do if you find a kill of a predator? So I'm going to talk to you like I trap for y'all. First thing you're going to do is call me. You're going to take as many pictures as you can. Um, definitely take pictures and try to make a best guess on what killed it. Is it bobcat? Is it coyote? Take pictures. Send me the pictures. Um, show me. Coyotes are always going to grab animals from down here or from the back end. Bobcats are always going to grab from the back of the neck, and you're going to see claw marks on their chest where they're holding on trying to choke something out. Definitely just call, the, call your trapper. Call, call the guy doing the predator control. Let him know immediately. Is that, yeah, that, that works. What was? Mm-hmm. Yep. I do. So the government pulled the funding. So now, the only, to answer your question, government trappers cannot run M44s right now. They had, the, and Tad did a good job scaring the ever living snot out of me. Anyways, government trappers had the funding pulled on their program, which means the state's not going to buy them M44s, and it's not going to buy them the cartridges for it. I, as a private trapper, can still do it. The only problem I might run into is there's one place in America that makes cyanide capsules and cyanide equipment, and that's in Idaho. And I'm willing to bet the state business is about 90% of their business. So if that goes away, they'll shut the whole thing down. But the... The state guys are the ones that can't do it. And to be honest, I've seen, I've gone and cleaned a lot of messes up from some of those state guys. So 
that brought up a good point. Let me talk about state guys real quick. There's a lot of great state trappers. There's really a lot of guys that can straight get it when it comes to catching coyotes. The problem is, it doesn't matter. If you're in one county, you can't imagine the workload they have. Like, they're never going to be able to come into your place and set up for seven months and protect your animals. They can come in and get one or two out of there, and then they're out of there. And that's not them being rude. It's not them being bad people. That's just the way the state has them structured. So they can't really be ef effective in you all sense. Any other questions, snaring questions? Go ahead. Yes, to an extent. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say, oh, no, you don't have any coyotes because I saw 10 rabbits. I would say you're doing a lot better on coyote populations if you're starting to see rabbits in the areas of your ranches where you didn't see rabbits. Uh, you know, when, when most predators come through your place, most animals know where they can and can't be. So, like, rabbits might move. But when you start seeing rabbits in places where you never saw them, that's a good indication. Very good indication. I'll tell you what, after, I have a snare in the back of my truck. Uh, I'm not going to lie to you, I forgot to bring it in for this. But after this talk, I, can, I have a trap, a snare, and a conibear bear that I, I can show you how to set a snare. No. Yep. From a, li from a liability standpoint, I, I pull the guns. I mean, it's, you can sit there and tell me, like, oh, it's okay, you know, it is what it is. But, you know, somebody raises a prize hog dog, and all of a sudden he eats it on an M44. They act different. <laughs> no, I mean, that's a, that's a good question, too. So, number one, calling will not screw me up. Okay, that coyote, if you... I tell most ranch owners this because they ask, they, can we go call? First off, if you see a coyote on your place, shoot every bullet you got at it, okay? If you shoot one, you might as well shoot five. He, he's figured it out after that first shot. You might as well give him every shot you got if you don't hit him. Coyotes aren't going to really associate what I do and me, per se, with, uh, let's say, if you're the ranch manager, you drive around your own place and you calling and running dogs, they're actually going to probably make two different associations. Now, I would say if you did that with the hog dogs, the minute you turn those dogs loose and they start barking, that would probably send the coyotes out. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've seen coyotes. I've seen five hog dogs go in the thicket after a coyote or after a pig, and all five came running back out, and here came two males. They will, they will not tolerate that. Any domestic dog. I, I use a lab to catch coyotes, my lab B. What I do is I walk her down the road. If I can't figure out where I've got to be exactly, I'll walk her down, and she'll mark anywhere a coyote marks. So when she does that, coyotes will not tolerate that, and they will work that set. So that's how I use my dog. I use domestic dogs to catch coyotes. Go ahead. You first. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they'll gang up. They'll be worse than coyotes. <laughs> so first and foremost, I have nothing but respect for predators and animals. Uh, I try to treat each animal with respect. I don't turn coyotes loose, but when it comes to dogs... So that's a big problem East Texas guys have. That's a good example. East Texas guys have that problem. Uh, man, you get three feral dogs, they gang up, that's a problem. That's a lot. That's, that's basically like you gaining a wolf. You know, uh, I tell people this. If you call me out to look at an animal dead, and that animal is strung from this stage to that back door, my guess is that was young and inexperienced coyotes that made a mess of it. Now, if you walk up to a full-grown axis, and you can tell that one coyote grabbed a hold of them and brought them down, Killed him and ate him in a 10-foot circle. Yeah, that's a bad dude right there. That guy knows what he's doing. That's one thing a lot of people, they see those big kills. They think it must have been a lot of coyotes. I'm like, no, it's probably just two coyotes that didn't know what they were doing and made a mess out of it. 
So. No, Caracaris and your sheep species. Uh, anything that's going to have an insanely small, small fawn. Like uh, I've seen Caracaris sit there and watch black buck does give birth. And when that baby hit the ground, it was on. And as long as after birth's involved, that smell is out there, uh, Caracaris would be pretty bad. I've been seeing a lot of bald eagles everywhere lately. Uh, don't know what you do about that, but... <laughs> It happens. Let me rephrase that. I'm not doing anything about that. <laughs> yeah, so my opinion, I wouldn't go through that process. I mean, <laughs> I've never met a game warden who's willing to go write a ticket over a Kara Kara. I mean, I'm not trying to tell you what to do, but it's, you're in a situation where you may not have the seven days to deal with it. If that's what's going on, you may not have seven days to deal with it if you're in the middle of fawning. So, questions? Coyotes are bad. They eat animals. Trap them. All right, thank you all. Good job, dude. You did great. Good job, dude.